All right, so take your Bibles and turn to Hebrews chapter 13. Our text today is going to be verses 4 to 6. <clears throat> Last Sunday's message was titled, uh, Let Brotherly Love Continue, and called this Let Love Continue Part 2. So uh, you can stick a brotherly in there if you want to, so you really make it truly Part 2. <clears throat> Or you can change last time the message title to just let love continue. <laughs> However you want to do it. All right. Let me, um, let me just begin here by giving you just, uh, again, an overview of the book of Hebrews and how this all fits together because it's really important that you understand uh, this. Uh, otherwise, sometimes what we do is we, we lose um, the effectiveness of the commands of God in chapter 13 when we don't see it in light of the doctrine that the, the writer of Hebrews has written to us. So what the writer has done is that he has outlined the doctrine of the Son in chapters 1 through 10. Okay, so it's all about the Son. You look at the verse, first few verses. God spoke in the past through the prophets. Now he's speaking to us through the Son. And then he talks about the Son of Man and, and how he is raised to to the throne above and, <clears throat> and how he is greater than everything else. And, and it's really all about the Son. And, and, and uh, so what we see in this whole section of doctrine is that the Son has spoken. Uh, Jesus is the authoritative voice of God to his church, to the Christians, to you, you and me. Not, not only because he is God's Son, but because he is the Son of Man who now sits on the throne of God uh, by virtue of the saving work which he has completed. Okay, so that gives him the authority to speak to us authoritatively. And uh, we need to listen. Uh, Jesus is God's appointed prophet. Jesus is God's appointed priest. Jesus is God's appointed king. And Jesus has not only completed the requirements for our justification, where we are now at peace with God, but he has brought in a new covenant and a new law, which we're going to see is highlighted in chapter 13. So as we come to the, the last chapters of the book of Hebrews, uh, we're not only, we are not only given a picture of the Christian life, uh, but we are given the commands that actually form the law of Christ, or at least a partial list of those commands. Uh, throughout the entire New Testament, we can collect the commands of, of, uh, of Christ. Uh, and of course, the, the last chapter of uh, the book is very thorough in that respect. So the Christians <clears throat> and the true believer then, Hebrews tells us, lives by faith. That's the message of chapters 10, beginning at verse 19, right through uh, to the end of chapter 11. The Christian, the true believer, lives by faith, and, and we have focused on that. Okay? His hope, or our hope, because we're believers in Christ, our hope is centered in the promises of God, which are still future for us. Okay, God has, Jesus has fulfilled many of them, but there's still some promises that are still future for us. And, and like the promises of the resurrection, the promises of our inheritance of eternal life in the presence of God. Okay, so by faith, we are assured of that in which we put our hope and trust. Hebrews 11.1 1. By faith, we are convinced uh, that what is promised will come to pass. By faith, we believe that God exists and that His reward, the fulfillment of His promises in Christ, will be given us who seek Him. It is trusting in the sovereign God in every circumstance and in every certain situation that comes into our lives. That's what living by faith is all about. It's connected then to the very promises of God, uh, which is the foundation of our hope. Right? And then living by faith. <clears throat> so it's living then, as chapter 11 defines for us, that it, we're living as strangers and exiles uh, in this world. Okay? This is not our world. We're only passing through. 
Um, we're waiting for the desire of our heart, which is the better country, 1116, that God has prepared for us. Uh, the, the heavenly uh, Jerusalem, the, the, um, the Zion above. <clears throat> so you and I are, are living in this world, but we're not living for this world. Okay, now that doesn't mean that we don't enjoy the benefits that come in this world. I mean, there are a lot of things that we can benefit from. Um, Mary already told us one of the nice benefits that we can have this osmosis water now. I mean, that's a benefit of this world. And, <clears throat> and we can certainly enjoy that to drinking water that's not tasty, right? And, 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 uh, but well, we don't live for this world. We live for the world that is to come because we're strangers and exiles. Okay, that, that's where our hope is, that's where our focus is, that's where I, our eyes are centered. Okay, and, and so as we're looking there, we, we know and we understand just by our own lives, our own experiences and the experience of others, that this life um, is actually very hard and it's very difficult. And, and, uh, and at times we feel like we are in prison. At, at times we feel like that this world really mistreats us in many ways. Uh, sometimes physically, sometimes uh, um, in our health, sometimes financially, some, sometimes in our employment, all, all kinds of different ways. But all of the, these pressures and difficulties of life come because that is this life. It is this age. And we don't belong to this age. We belong to the age to come, which is, uh, if you read uh, Revelation 21, uh, doesn't have any of those problems, uh, any of those uh, <clears throat> difficulties. Okay, and, and the thing is that Hebrews then exhorts us that, um, um, that there are enemies who tempt us to doubt and to sin and to turn away from God and abandon Jesus and his, and his church, but it encourages us to run with endurance the race that is set before us. Now, 12 verse 1. Okay, it tells us that, that we are not running this alone. It's not... Um, that uh, we're running the race alone and everybody's cheering us on. No, we're running together. The cloud of witnesses that we have, they're, they're running with us. Okay? We run with the church. We run with the body of Christ, uh, with the Christians that we fellowship with, uh, that we learn with, that we struggle with. Uh, we're all in this together. <clears throat> and we are encouraged by Jesus, who is the only one who has actually endured to the end. Okay? He's the only one who's come to the end. And, and completely endured. That's chapter 12, verses 2 to 3. And we're running toward Him. Okay? We keep our eyes on the prize. Uh, who is Jesus? Okay? That, that's what we do. Um, he endured the hostility of people, it tells us, and the horror of the cross, uh, in order to become the founder of our faith, in order that, that we would be saved through Him, but also the perfecter of our faith. So that... Uh, that that uh, we grow in righteousness, okay? And we grow to become more and more like uh, our founder, more and more like Jesus. And so he's teaching us faith. He, he's teaching us dependence. He's, he's teaching us uh, and producing within us righteousness um, by changing us, by changing the way we think, the way we, uh, the way we act, uh, uh, the way we, um, we look at this world. He's uh, using circumstances and people to strengthen our spirits and to weaken our flesh. And it's, of course, it's all for our, own, our good, um, and it, but it's also for His glory. It says that in chapter 12, verses 10 and 12. Now, in, in Hebrews chapter 12, verse 14, it, it says, Everyone is to strive for peace and for the holiness without which no one will see the Lord. So we, we are to strive to get along with one another, and, and the implication there is that, that we're not only getting along with everybody within the body of Christ, but we get along with the world as well. I mean, we live with believers and unbelievers. In fact, most of our time is spent in the presence of unbelievers. And, and we strive to bring the peace of God into our relationships. We strive for holiness. Uh, it says the, the holiness, uh, the sanctification. Uh, that separates us from the world, that demonstrates that we live for Jesus. Why? Because Jesus is our Lord. He, and the writer of Hebrews gets very specific now as to how we are to do this, how we are to live in a society in which, in a way which proclaims Christ lives within. 
So when we come to chapter 13, then, we, we find that there are 15 exhortations or 15 commands that we are to put into practice in our lives. And, and, and we learn to live by these, if we learn to live by these commands, there will be no doubt that we are Christians <clears throat> and have been changed by Jesus in the gospel. Now, this is our calling, and it's contrary to the way of the world. Uh, we, we know that there were five uh, particular sections of Hebrews that we call the five warnings, and, and they were pretty strong. And, and in those five warnings, he was really contrasting the, the, um, the confessing believer who isn't really saved versus the true believer. And uh, he says uh, all of these warnings really apply to the untrue believer, the false convert. But they, they, they serve as a warning to make, cause the true believer to actually look up and to take notice of what is happening and uh, to, to change and fix the situation. That's why the warnings are there. Okay, but <clears throat> and, and so we have this contrast, and, and it's because Christians, you see, follow the, the laws. We're, we're not a lawless society. We follow the laws of Christ, and there are commands then for us to, to obey, and that's what we do. Now, this is our calling. This is our calling. And, and these exhortations that are in this last chapter, they really are timeless exhortations. Now, it's timeless because it doesn't matter what period you live in, these exhortations always apply. And one of the reasons why they always apply is because the, the sin of the world is timeless. The sins of the world will always show up. You will always live with with uh, impurity, uh, immorality, and persecution. Those things will always be there. And uh, because of the hearts of the people um, uh, are the same wherever you go. It doesn't matter what country you go in. It doesn't matter what period of time. The hearts of the people are all the same. And uh, they're described in the scriptures as being sinners in rebellion against God. So the principles of sin are the same. The principles of sanctification and holiness in the life of a believer are also the same. So whether you're a believer in China, India, Turkey, or Canada, or any other place in the world, the principles of sanctification transcend time. So these commands are not just for the, the Christians uh, they're, in, they're in the first century, but they're, they're for every Christian of every century, of every time. So that includes you and me. So the 15 exhortations of chapter 13 then uh, are there for us to obey uh, and to put into practice. They represent our calling in this world. They, they describe our behavior as a believer. They tell us, tell us what God expects of us. Uh, they are practical guidelines for the life of a believer. So if you believe in Jesus today, if you call yourself a Christian and a follower of Christ, then, then you want to know these. You, you, you want to take them to heart. You want, to, you want to, to meditate on them. You want to, to apply them to your life uh, because this is your calling. Uh, uh, this is your life as a Christian. Now Peter calls this, the, actually he calls this the will of God. Uh, if you want to take your Bibles and just turn back to 1 Peter for a second, here we'll look at 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 15. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 15. I'll wait till everybody's got it. And, you know, there's nothing worse than listening to a, a preacher preach. He tells you to turn to a text and then he immediately starts reading and you haven't got there yet. Nothing worse than that. See? So it's Hebrew James Peter. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 15. Okay, so, so everybody got it? All right, let's take a look at the text there. It says, for this is the will of God. You see that? This is the will of God. Well, what is the will of God? That by doing good, you should put to silence the ignorance of foolish people. That's really an interesting verse because what he's saying there is, is that God has willed it that when Christians do good, they shut the mouths of the world. They shut up the mouths of the world. So it, it's the manner in which we live in the world that shuts them up. It, it shuts up their criticism. The way you live in society has a way of influencing people. 
And in particular, it shuts the mouths of the critics of Christianity. It's really interesting, um, uh, Pliny the, uh, the Younger, uh, Pliny was the governor of Bithynia in the year 112 uh, AD. Uh, he was the Pontus, that's the governor, so you know at the time of Christ it was Pontius Pilate, but this is Pontius Pliny, Pliny the Younger. <clears throat> and uh, he, he wrote a number of letters to the emperor, to the emperor Trajan at that time. And uh, um, we have all of those, those letters um, have been preserved. Well, not all of the letters he wrote, but, but over, well over 200 of the letters that he wrote. And in one of the letters that he wrote to Trajan, he was writing to Trajan saying, I'm trying to find how I can convict the Christians and condemn them. He says, but I'm having a problem. This is what he said. Let me quote it for you. They bound themselves by an oath not to any criminal end, but to avoid theft or robbery or adultery, never to break their word or repudiate a deposit when called on to refund it, end quote. Very simply, what he's saying there is that the Christians, they, 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 they had determined that they would do not commit crimes and they pay back all of their debts. And that's totally opposite to the world. So here he is, he's trying to find reasons to condemn them at, for being Christians, and he can't do it because their lifestyle is such that, uh, uh, that he can't find anything. Now a little later on, Trajan just decides, well, if they just call themselves a Christian, then you can go ahead and, and persecute them. In fact, Pliny came up with the rule after Trajan's response, and he said, if they uh, will say three times that they're a Christian, then that's enough to condemn them. Anyways, so but, but you see, it, it's it's the way we live in this world that uh, um, that affects them. Um, the Roman sacral society, uh, in, in that sacral society, the Christians did not support the state religion. They had a different objective than the religion, but they still supported the state, and that made it really hard for them to condemn them. In fact, continue on there. Look at verses 16 and 17 of First Peter chapter two. And look, look at what Peter says there, because this is really interesting. He says, live then as people who are free, not using your freedom as a cover-up for evil, but as living as servants of God. Honor everyone, love the brotherhood, fear God, then honor who? The honor the emperor. That's Trajan. He's, uh, well, it wasn't Trajan at that time, but uh, honor the emperor. <clears throat> We, we, we are in this world to influence the world. Uh, and our influence, uh, uh, God uses that. So, um, <clears throat> this is so different even from the Old Covenant. Uh, in the Old Covenant, uh, uh, they had to, to, to uh, obey um, the command, and they, they didn't care about anybody else, Jews only. They had hatred for, for the Romans. Uh, and for everybody else. They weren't going to, to fit into anything within the Roman society. Okay? But, but here, the Christians, they're, they're to influence society for Christ. Uh, the way you, they live within society not only shuts the mouths of criticism, but it also re results in fruit. Okay? It, it results in people being saved. It results in God being glorified. And that's one of the reasons why God wants us to do it. And of course, that's why when we come to the book of Hebrews in chapter 12, verse 18, um, this is what he meant when he says, let us offer God acceptable worship with reverence and awe. He's talking about the way we live. Okay? The way we live is to bring the acceptable worship to God. You know, in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus uh, said in Matthew 5, 16, he said, said this, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your God who is in heaven. See? <clears throat> Let your, your life shine. See, we have an influencing power when we, when we obey God, when we, uh, we uh, follow His commands, when we live the way He wants us to live. What better motivation is there to live a life of obedience uh, to the commands of Hebrews 13 than the fact that God the Father will be glorified by the way we live? 
and not only glorified by us, but glorified by others uh, who look at our lives. Well, bef before we, we go into our text today, there's actually one more thing that I want to teach you this morning, or at least make sure that you understand that I've sort of alluded it several times. Um, but I, I want to make you understand uh, um, uh, <clears throat> um, something here in preparation. Well, blah. Ruined that sentence, didn't I? <laughs> so here's what I want you to understand. The, the, the criticism of New Covenant theology is that we are antinomian. Have you heard of that word before, antinomian? Okay, the, the word antinomian comes from two Greek words. Anti, which means against, and nomos, meaning law. So to be antinomian means that you are against the law. And the criticism is that we are against uh, God's law because we, uh, uh, we, don't, we say that we are no longer under the Ten Commandments. Now, theologically, antinomianism is the belief that there are no moral laws that God expects Christians to obey. Now, we have no laws. We can live however we want. Yeah, but is that true? Is that what we believe? No, we don't believe that. We're not antinomian. We believe that there are laws. Okay? And the reason they accuse us of this is because we believe the Bible teaches that we are no longer under the Old Covenant, which included the Ten Commandments. We're no longer bound to obey the Ten Commandments, nor any law that is within the Old Covenant. But that does not mean that we have no law, that we are lawless. The Christians cannot live any way they want. Okay? There are laws. And again, in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus made it very clear that he did not come to abolish the law, but to fulfill it. Okay? They are fulfilled in Jesus, which means that that we obey the law as Jesus now teaches it to the Christians. And all you got to do is read the rest of chapter 5 and chapter 6 of, of Matthew, and you see how Jesus um, raised the standard, a standard that is above the law. So where the law said, do not uh, murder, he says, no, he says, if you have hatred in your heart, you have committed murder. And so it's a higher standard. And, and, uh, and it's not the law of of uh, murder that we are to obey, uh, although we do obey that because we it's inherently part of it, uh, but but we we strive not to hate, not to hate others. In Colossians two seventeen, Colossians two seventeen, Paul says that the law is quote a shadow of the things to come, but the substance of it belongs to Christ. Okay? In other words, Jesus Himself is the new law. He fulfilled the old law, and now he proclaims the new law for us. In, in Galatians chapter 3, verses 19 to 28, there it, it says that, that we were held captive under the law until Christ came to set us free. And now that Jesus has come, the, no, the law is no longer needed except in the way that he preserves it and, and uh, the way he teaches it. In 1 Corinthians 9, verses 19 to 21, Paul identifies there that there are three different groups of people. Okay, the first group are the Jews, who he describes as being under the law. The second group are the Gentiles, Gentiles who he describes as being outside of the law. Uh, and then the third group are the Christians, uh, who are, as he says, quote, under the law of Christ. So there you have it specifically stated that, that we are under the law of Christ. Again, in 1 Corinthians 7, verse 19, Paul tells us that in contrast to the law, the only thing that matters is keeping the commandments of God. Uh, C.K. Barrett, in his, uh, his book, the first epistle to the Corinthians, uh, he says that Paul is what Paul means here is that uh, God's commandments now... Uh, he sees God's commandments now as the law of Christ. All right, so, so I just want to make sure that you understood that, that, that we are under a law. In, in the New Covenant, there is the law of Christ. Now, he, Hebrews chapter 3, when we come to Hebrews, uh, in verses 5 to the first part of 6, there it tells us very clearly that, that it is Christ and not Moses who stands over God's house. Okay, Jesus fulfills the law of Moses, and he becomes then the new lawgiver. So that's in Hebrews chapter 3. 
And, and then the, the writer of Hebrews is even more specific, uh, explicit in this, when in Hebrews chapter 7, verse 12, we just talked about Jesus uh, be, being uh, a priest after the order of Melchizedek. And in, in chapter 7, verse 12, it says, For when there is a change in the priesthood, there is necessarily a change in the law as well. So Aaron's priesthood gave way for Christ's priesthood, and uh, the, the, law, the, uh, uh, the law was given away for the new law, which was brought in, uh, which is the law of Christ. So there again, it's emphasized in the book of Hebrews. And I think that this is the unwritten um, meaning behind the exhortations of chapter 13, is that uh, we are running a race, but we, we are, we're running it with purpose. And the thing that defines the purpose is the very laws of Christ and the commands of Christ on our life that tell us how we live, what God expects of us uh, in living in this world. <clears throat> So last week, of course, we looked at Hebrews chapter 13, verses 1 to 3, and we examined the first four of the commands. And, and we are commanded there to continue to love other Christians. We're commanded there to show hospitality. We're commanded to reach out to other Christians who are going through hard times, like, like um, imprisonment and, uh, um, <clears throat> and mistreatment. And of course, we can make our parallels to those for us today. And at the end of the message, I quoted for you from Galatians chapter 6, verse 2, as a kind of summary of these first four commands. So I want you to turn in your Bible again. This was part of our scripture reading this morning. So turn in your Bibles to Galatians chapter 6, and I want you to look at verse 2 again. Because if it didn't jump out at you before, it's going to jump out at you again this time. Okay, so remember, the, the essence of the first four commands of chapter 13 are bear one another's burdens. Okay? Okay, have you got it there? Galatians 2, 6, verse 2. Look at what it says. It says, bear one another's burdens. Well, there it is. And so fulfill what? The law of Christ. The law of Christ. The law of Christ. Yeah. You, you see, we are under law. We're under the law of Christ. So you see, the ex these exhortations here, are they're not just suggestions. And we need to understand this. They're not suggestions. They are actual commands. Um, there is a sense in which they hold the force of the Ten Commandments under the Old Covenant. And why do they do that? Because they, they are, in fact, the law of Christ for us. So the writer of Hebrews has spent a lot of time developing the, the doctrine of the Old Covenant, that, that it has been fulfilled, it's been obsolete. Remember Hebrews chapter 8, okay? Um, chapter 12, Mount Sinai no longer exists, and, um, and that when the last remnant of the temple has been destroyed, the Old Covenant will vanish away. Okay, that's chapter 8, verse 13. Okay, there, there's a new mountain upon which we are to climb to reach to God. And, and it's called Mount Zion. And it, its base is the cross of Christ, but its pinnacle is the new heavenly Jerusalem. It, it's the eternal city of the living God. It, it's the new world which is yet to come. Right? And that's where we're heading to. And, and the other mountains no longer exist. Now in Galatians chapter 4 and 5, Paul contrasts there the Old Covenant and the New Covenant in the um, uh, allegory of the two women, Hagar and Sarah. Hagar is, uh, stands for the Old Covenant, Sarah stands for the New Covenant. And, and he shows there that the motivation for keeping the Old Covenant was selfishness. We already talked about this when we, we read Galatians chapter 5. We obey the Old Covenant law because we were slaves who were trying to earn our salvation. Okay, well we had an obligation to, to obey whether we liked it or not, uh, because we're slaves. Um, but the pattern of the new law, the new law of Christ, is, is love. Um, this is the new motivation, because we're no longer condemned by the law or under the law. We're free to love and free to keep the law of Christ. So again, I just want to look at Galatians 5.13. So I want to point this out to you. <clears throat> Galatians 5.13. For you are called to freedom, brothers. Okay, well, we're called to freedom. That's free from that uh, old covenant law. 
We're called the Freedom Brothers. Only do not, not use your freedom as an opportunity for the flesh. In other words, you can't live your life any way you want to do. But through what? Love. Through love, serve one another. <laughs> there it is again. The whole thing about the love now is focused on our relationships and how we live toward how we are to live towards one another. And we love. Through love, we serve one another. We're free now to, to serve one another out of love for them and not out of obligation as slaves. Now look at verse 14. <clears throat> for the whole law is fulfilled in one word. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. Now that's actually seven words. Um, but what, what is the one word? Love. 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 So, so how, do, how, how, do you, how does love fulfill the, fulfill the law? Well, it fulfills it through Christ. Because Christ is the epitome of love. And that's what the first part in, in chapter 5 that we read is actually talking about. That, that is through Christ's own sacrifice. Christ as being the seed of Abraham has, uh, is, came and sacrificed himself. That it was by his love that he actually became a man. It's through his love that he obeyed the law. That it's by his love that he went to the cross. So the love, his love of motivation becomes the pattern of the law of Christ. A whole pattern of the Christian life is love. Uh, love especially for one another. Uh, look at verse uh, 6. Galatians 5, 6. For in Christ Jesus neither circumcision nor uncircumcision. Now what he means by that is neither being under the law like a Jew or outside the law like a Gentile counts for anything. Counts for anything? Well, the context defines the anything. Uh, it tells us that the anything is righteousness. All right, so, so, so in Christ, it doesn't matter whether you're a Jew or, or you're Gentile, your works don't count for anything. They don't count for righteousness, but only, look at the verse, only faith working through what? Love. Through love. Through love. Well, what love? It may be talking about the expression of our faith in our love towards one another, but I think it's really referring here to the love that Jesus has for us. The love that brought him down to earth as a man. And took him to the cross. You see, Paul's point here is that our faith is rooted not in the law, but it's rooted in Christ Jesus, who fulfilled the law out of love for us. And now his love is working us in us as the motivation to live uh, the essence of the law or the pattern of, of the law of Christ. Okay, in other words, fruit, uh, faith. Faith is the root, and fruit, I'm getting this wrong, faith is the root, and love is the fruit. Okay, there we go. That sounds a little better when you get it right, doesn't it? Faith is the root, love is the fruit. Maybe I shouldn't have tried to be so poetic. But again, yeah, okay, so... so so how does, that, that really fits into Hebrews chapter 13, verse 1, because what does verse 1 say? Hey, you got it there? Somebody tell me, what does 13, Hebrews 13, 1 say? Let brotherly love continue. Let brotherly love continue. Okay, there's the first command, and it's really the command that covers it all. Okay. <laughs> Let the love continue. Right? I'm commanding you. Let this love continue. So here's the lesson. We are under the law of Christ, and the essence of the law of Christ is love for one another and for God. You know, J Jesus said in John 13, 34, he said, A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another. Just as I loved you, you are also to love one another. So loving one another is pretty important in, in the eyes of Christ, isn't it? I mean, he says it over and over several times. So these first four commands are what we sustain. Is that we are to sustain love and we are to sustain an empathy for one another in every circumstance and in every situation toward the unbeliever and also towards the believer, but especially for the believer. Now, why is that important? Why is that important? I think there's two reasons why that is important. And the first reason is because it reveals who we are to the world, it reveals who we are to the world. John 13, 35. All people will know that you are my disciples if you have what? Love for one another. Love for one another. So, how, what will people know? They're going to know that you're disciples of Christ. How? 
By your love towards one another. Wow. You, you mean the way I treat other Christians is actually the <clears throat> testimony of uh, that I'm a follower of Christ? Yeah. That's what he's saying. Okay. So it's important that we have brotherly love, that we do not neglect to show hospitality, uh, that we remember those who are in prison, that we remember those who are being mistreated, that we give to and help those who are in need. We need to do that because if we don't, the world doesn't know who we belong to. We may say we belong to Christ, but it's only our actions of love towards one another that proves it. <clears throat> the second reason why this is important is, is because uh, it lets you know that you are saved. Let's you know that you're saved. It also lets everybody else know. Okay, turn to turn in your Bibles here to 1 John 3.13. You need to see this. 1 John chapter 3, verse 14. 1 John chapter 3, verse 14. Okay, everybody there? Okay. We know that we have passed out of death into life. Okay, we know that we're saved, in other words, right? Okay, how, how do we know that we're saved? He answers it. We know that we have passed out of death and life because, what does it say? We love the brothers. We love the brothers. <laughs> how do you know you're saved? How do you know you're saved? Because we love the brothers. Wow. Whoever does not love abides in death. That's a huge contrast, isn't it? Okay, and what he's saying is, is that you may call yourself a Christian, but if you don't love one another, okay, you're actually living in death. That's your that's your future. A lot of people come and say, "Well, how do I know for certain that I, that that uh, did Noah say something profound there?" No, he was. He what said, does mean, "What does that Cliff? mean, Pastor Cliff?" Yeah. Oh, which one? To to love the brothers. That's a good question. Okay? It, 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 it means that, that we have to, uh, to do what Jesus said when he said, said that you are to, to show hospitality towards one another. So you're friendly to everybody. Do you know how to be friendly? Yeah. Yeah. You, you give me a hug every Sunday I come in here. That's really friendly. That's showing hospitality. Okay? And the other way is that, is that we remember those who are having, going through struggles. Okay, sometimes in hard times, and so you come up to them, you put your arm around them, and you say, you know what, I'm praying for you. Uh, or, or let me pray for you right now. Those are ways that we can show the love. Or some, some, somebody might be um, uh, having some really struggles, and, and so we can help them out. And, and it might mean giving them some, some food or some money or, or things like that. Right? Do you have money, Noah? You got money? Yeah. No, no, you don't got money. You're too little for money. But but maybe you can give some food, right? To somebody who needs help. To somebody who needs help. Yeah. So that's how we love. I don't have money or food to send my mommy and daddy. All right. Yeah. There's other things you can How can you show your love for your mom? You can pick up your toys, right? Okay. And lots of different things that you can do. And that's what it means there. Okay? And, 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 um, <clears throat> and so these commands, you see, they become, they become very, very practical. They're telling us how we are to live. They tell us what God expects of us. Uh, uh, oh, my. <clears throat> I haven't even started our text yet. <laughs> wow. Wow. <laughs> Part three. What was that? Part three. Part three. Yeah. Well, you know, I, I think maybe I'll lay. I will leave it there because I mean that, that's a good introduction to get into it. Yeah. Just don't do it again. Just don't do that introduction again next week. Okay. I know in my early days uh, when I was started preaching, Bernie kept saying, "Saying you spend too much time." reiterating what you said the week before and that you run out of time to say what you wanted to say this week so I, I, I tried to, I mean I, I know I, I said something similar last week but but it's a different slant because we need to understand that it, that it is the law of Christ we're not lawless people and the law of Christ is based on love 
and, and, uh, and so all of these commands are commands to help us to live in this world. Why? Because it, it, it stops the criticism of the world. It, 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 um, it, it uh, tells the world that we actually are, in fact, a Christian. And, and, and it tells us, it confirms to us and to other believers that we are, in fact, saved. And that's why it is so important. So do you want know to, friends, I, I'm going to stop there. Um, <clears throat> I didn't have much in terms of verse 4. But uh, I think I'll, I'll stop there. And, uh, and we'll pick this up again next week at, uh, at verse 4. Are you okay with that? Yeah, you don't want to so start again. change your slide that we're not starting Ecclesiastes <laughs> on the 8th of December. Well, you never know. <laughs> <laughs> so that's what we were supposed to do today. But, uh, but you know, just all i got to do is give it a little click and we're done. Just like that. <laughs> well, let's, let's, let's bow in prayer, shall we? Father, you know, <clears throat> you're, you're, we, we've looked at a lot of verses from the Scriptures today, Lord. Things to, to help us to understand the very mind of the, the writer of Hebrews and the direction that the Holy Spirit was taking him to, that, that when he came to this culmination of commands in chapter 13, we, we, we needed to realize that these aren't just suggestions for us, but they are actually the law of Christ, that, that they're your law for us. They're the, the things that we need to do, to need to obey and apply to our lives, that uh, they become, the, they, they change the, the manner of our life, the way we live in such a way that, that the world will know that we belong to you. And we just pray, O oh God, that you will help us to bring these things to, to fruition. That uh, we will bear the fruit of righteousness. <laughs> I mean, you're teaching us. I mean, that's the whole message of chapter 12 again. Lord, you're teaching us. You're, you're, you're disciplining us to become righteous. And, and uh, that's what we want to be. And so we, we just pray that you'll help us, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for, for Noah's input and how he, he directs us to the practicality of what it means. And uh, that was really good. And, and uh, <clears throat> so, Lord, I would just pray that, that the words that I spoke today will, will be encouraging and uh, will be um, useful in terms of living for your glory and bringing glory to you in all of our, all that we say and do in this world. So until we come together again next week, we just commit ourselves to you that, that uh, you will walk before us uh, and leading us, and we will follow wherever you lead. In Jesus' name, amen.